I've met everyone in the room. I'm Wendy Hoke Whitmer, Chief Mission Support Officer for Bridge of Home National. I believe we've all met co-presenting today with Becca Boland, our program consultation specialist. And what we are going to be doing for the next hour, which is a relatively short period of time, is inviting you to begin to synthesize everything you're hearing and taking in the time you've been here so far. So let me grab my notes. So I'm on target, except I don't know what I just did with them. Here we go. Okay, so we're talking about the Bridge of Hope Neighborhood of Support. That is our three-way partnership, including the, the neighboring family, the neighboring volunteers, and the neighborhood resource specialist or case manager, varieties of language will happen in our, in our network. We've been listening to great presentations. We, some of you have heard, uh, have been introduced to the new neighboring training. Some of you have been uh, divin, d dove, dived more deeply into our new benchmarks and standards. Uh, you've heard a lot about social capital. You've heard about trauma and family resilience. So we're going to talk about that in context of the Bridge of Hope neighborhood and invite you. This is going to be very interactive. Not a lot of new content because you've heard a lot already. Um, but we're going to invite you to begin to reimagine your work uh, and Bridge of Hope with all the new that you've heard and taken in. So just a couple things I want to say before Becca takes over. So when we look at some of the changes we're making to our, our neighborhood model, we're not doing a whole lot that's brand new. In some ways, we're returning to some of our roots. The Bridge of Hope uh, mentoring group model, three-way partnership, was first patterned after refugee resettlement. Um, and if you're familiar with refugee, refugee resettlement, it often involves uh, building a, a group from a church or faith community to surround a refugee family that is moving into the U.S. and just becoming settled. There's a case manager involved. But in my experience with refugee resettlement, there's a lot of tangible, hands-on stuff that the, the support groups that, um, provide for the families that in Bridge of Hope we've moved away from in recent years. We've moved away from uh, some of the tangible, sub tangible supports and that, that varies across our network in terms of how folks are implementing things. But we've really focused in recent years more on friendship and inviting uh, our mentors into friendship with families. And some of what we learned is that there's limitations to our language and how people perceive the role of mentor is different than sometimes what we intended or desired. And even when people got their intended or desired role of developing friendships with families, that doesn't always happen. And for, in fact, probably isn't likely to happen for even half of any given group. And what that left was mentors who felt like they hadn't done their job or weren't successful because they didn't achieve some level of friendship with the family. We've also recognized that uh, it, it devalues the other gifts that, that neighboring volunteers bring to, to the neighborhood. So in any of our own geographic neighborhoods, which this is not, but in your geographic neighborhood, you may have a variety of types of relationships. You may have the person you would borrow a cup of sugar from, the person who would jump your car, the person that would get your child off the bus for you, the person you'd sit with over a cup of tea and just share life's stories with. There's going to be a variety of relationships. All of them are valuable to you on any given day, at any given time or season of your life, uh, but they look very different and have different levels of intimacy. And we want to value all the gifts and kinds of roles that each neighboring volunteer can play in the life of a neighboring family. However intimate or close and connected that becomes, or however just peripherally supportive of a family that may be. Uh, let's see. So of course you've, you've all heard and been hearing our new focus on prioritizing the connecting of families with neighboring volunteers very early in their experience and also pushing again to prioritize housing early. Both of those we understand are, are difficult. They're difficult in our context where affordable housing is like non-existent in some of our communities. They're difficult in a context where uh, church attendance is changing, volunteerism is changing, etc. They're hard things and yet they are core to our mission and we can sit back and make excuses for why we can't achieve that anymore or we can work at thinking creatively and working in new ways and constantly striving to find ways to push against some of those norms in our society to make relationship and to make housing possible for families. So uh, Becca is going to 
offer a presentation that's probably going to feel terribly redundant of things that you've already heard. Just kind of summarizing, reminding us of the roles of the three um, partner, the three, the three roles, partnership roles in the Bridge of Hope neighborhood, and some of the ways that we're imagining them being different. But then we're going to have you work in groups together and answer some questions about. What's going to be different when you go home from this conference? What are you going to do differently in your work to build community and develop community in, in the neighborhoods, to work at the housing piece, to work at all these various out building social capital, et cetera? We're going to bring that to you and let you do some hard work together. Okay? So now I'm going to turn it over to Becca. And we're going to switch the mics around here. So give us just a moment. This is quite a process here. Oh, <laughs> Holy cow. I should have put it on my back, but I feel like I'm not on. <laughs> Hello? Well, I will do my best to be project. Um, so much of what <laughs> I don't, um, Wendy just said, I, I do feel a little bit like I'm redundant. You write your notes before you come to a conference and then you are blessed that they are being um, uh, confirmed and affirmed by the people and the speakers before you. So um, I just want to share, okay. There we go. I'm just going to hold on to it. Okay. okay. So I'm just going to talk a little bit about the three parts of the, neighbor, the Bridge of Hope neighborhood of support. And just maybe how their role has changed from what you might have been previously used to. So um, the neighboring family is a very important part of the Bridge of Hope neighborhood of support. And what you're going to find is that the, their role has not changed so much, but part of our perspective and part of our um, we are changing the way that we look at that of, at the family and part of it is being um, you're going to notice through the outcomes benchmarks and standards the term as desired by the family and that became a really really important piece for us in fact you might see it often like I feel like we would just go through and we're like oh we need that phrase here oh we need that phrase here because it became really important for us as we really focused on being trauma-informed we wanted to make sure that the family was in con is in control of their experience with Bridge of Hope so like we learned yesterday the ability to choose is really part of that healing. And we wanted to make sure that we were really communicating that. Um, understanding that the family is the expert on themselves. And also wanting to assure that physical, psychological, and emotional safety for the family. Um, somebody mentioned, and I apologize, um, maybe it was Margo this morning or Wendy this morning talking about wanting to do the least amount of harm like we really have a responsibility to our families and part of that is really letting them um, decide what the next steps are what would be best for them and that's part of doing least, the least amount of harm we also added the um, outcomes number two, strong and resilient families. So um, not to be redundant to what Dr. DeCandia said, but all families are resilient and have unique strengths and we really wanted to recognize that and we wanted that to be a focus of our experience with the families. So um, we have made it one of our outcomes so that we've added the assessment piece. Um, 
which I will get to later when I talk about the neighborhood resource specialist role. Um, so that is just a piece that is new with the family and the focus on working with the whole family. Again, yesterday or this morning, everything's blending together. If you um, were with Dr. DeCandia, she said, don't forget the children. Like if there is one thing that we can walk out of here, it's don't forget the children. And so with that, we have already, <laughs> we were already focused on expanding our, our services to the whole family, much from their Services Mat Matters article. And um, if you're not familiar with the ACEs study, the reason that that was part of the influence in wanting to make sure that we were focusing on the whole family, children are uniquely impacted by their stability of their environment. And I, um, we talked about brain um, functioning this morning with trauma. And I love the fact, I, I, I was driving home one night really late and on NPR I heard two physicians talking about the ACEs um, study and it, I was able to, we found this idea that the caring, loving support or relationship with an adult in a child's life like can actually like negate the effects of it, the ACEs. And so like when you think about the fact that as um, and it's even more significant, let me just say this, it's even more significant when that adult, that caring, supportive adult is a parent. So like when you think about that, that excites me because there is like um, potential in your role as a neighborhood resource specialist that you are gonna empower the parent to be able to change um, their parenting styles or be help them to create a, an environment of stability. And with that, then, you are impacting the life of a child to make um, have a better outcome, that you're decreasing those ACEs. Like, to me, that's exciting. That gives us, um, like, that gives me energy to do my work. And so I hope you feel that energy, too, in what you're doing. The second partner is the neighboring volunteers. And this might be the piece that you will see or you'll start to see more changes here. So part of it's that we're going back to the original as, um, Wendy had already mentioned the refugee, let me just start by saying, um, we're, tangible support is becoming a, a focus and part of that is going back to the refugee model. And we're also learning that out of shared activities develops relationship. And I've been kind of thinking about that lately. It's not like I'm gonna walk up to somebody on the street and suddenly be their friend. You can't just pass somebody and say, and just, instantly have that connection or that's the rarity it's not very common but what is common is to connect with the person that you meet at church or to sit at your child's soccer practice and have um, relationship with the parents that are on the sidelines why because we have those mutual activities those mutual times and so if we're asking neighboring volunteers to develop those relationships, we really want to encourage that friendship and we still want that to happen, but it's most likely gonna happen through tangible supports. Um, and some of those examples may be mowing the lawn, providing transportation, locating donated furniture, preparing meals for a family who might need them, childcare, taking care of children. Um, and so it's those types of idea, that idea that we're like hoping that neighboring volunteers will be able to provide those tangible supports which will lead to the relationship. The other piece which we're very familiar with is social capital. After today, you have plenty of examples and hopefully a definition <laughs> of social capital. But the one thing I wanna capture is neighboring volunteers are bringing their own personal networks, but you as an organization are also bringing your personal, or your, not personal, your organizational connections. So that is something that we really wanna emphasize. I think many, uh, many locations were already doing that, but that idea that, um, we know that you can get shoes at this place or we have this connection with this other organization who is um, providing, well, actually, I just saw Bonnie and I'm gonna use her as an example, but you know, Bonnie had a connection and had diapers for a family and they collected like five months worth of diapers for this family. And so like she was able to use her cap social capital to help provide for this family. So not only are the neighboring volunteers using their resources and connections, but you as an organization or a location are using your, your networks. Um, and I'm not gonna go into any more of that because hopefully 
you uh, captured that today, and there will be more to come, I'm sure. Um, we're encouraging mutuality, that each person has their own unique contributions. So I've heard the example before that um, a, a neighboring volunteers will often have families over for dinner, but in this mutuality we're recognizing the gifts and talents that the family brings as well. And I've heard stories of where the family has like a really unique recipe or a cultural um, F f flavor that they can prepare for the neighboring volunteers and they want to do that and so it's celebrating those gifts and talents and making it um, a mutual give and take and that is, so that might be something that's new or um, and then encouraging and supporting um, which isn't really necessarily new but um, it's just a continuation from before, encouraging notes, letters, friendship, calls. Um, and I think, again, it goes back to what we talked about before, the empowering the family to meet their own goals. And that goes from the shift of neighboring, to the definition of what people might have thought as mentoring to um, the definition of neighboring. We're not mentoring, we're not necessarily sharing our opinions and our adv advice unless sought. We're not saying, well, this is what the family should be doing. And so we're just kind of, our role in this room is to be working with the neighboring volunteers to kind of work through that and help them um, understand their role and how they can empower families, what that might look like. And then the last piece is embracing the spirit of neighboring. And um, I'm going to go into that in a, in a minute, but I'm, um, yeah, I'm going to go to the next one. So a neighborhood resource specialist then is looking to facilitate and guide the neighborhood development. And I am super excited about this change, yet I think it will be a little bit uncomfortable because what it's doing is really taking your role as a neighborhood resource specialist and what you're, what you're doing is instead of necessarily becoming a part of the neighborhood, you are helping the creation of the neighborhood. And so I found this community development model um, that I'm going to do a call on later on in the, at some point in the future. But the, the idea is this, that at the beginning, as you're starting to foster and create those relationships, that neighborhood launch is super important. That is like, you're starting the neighborhood. This is your role. You're starting to create and help that family make those connections, whether it's through the activities that you're designing, whether it's through um, helping the family talk through before they walk into that door um, or walk into the neighborhood launch, what they might be experiencing, helping the neighboring volunteers at training understand what might be out expected and happening during the neighborhood launch. It is that you are that facilitator of relationship. And so that at the beginning, it creates, it's a high involvement. And then the second step um, is when the neighborhood is established and you start to back out. So um, I've heard examples of where like a family would typically call an FRC or an NRS, Neighborhood Resource Specialist, and, all, and then instead of calling them, they called a neighboring volunteer. Like that's how that transition is happening. And then at the end when the community is mature in the, um, Scott Peck is the one who came up with the community development model. Um, when that's, I think it was him, sorry. Um, but when that community is mature, then you're backing out. They're going to graduation and you're kind of stepping out um, and allowing that community to kind of continue. So I use the word community interchangeably with neighborhood. Like this is the neighborhood is going to, um, the neighborhood is going to continue even as they're not in Bridge of Hope anymore. You're also, um, an increased emphasis on supporting the relationship building and resolving the conflict. So that might mean like a little bit of mediation, um, helping uh, each, helping the neighboring volunteers and helping the neighboring family take have a different perspective. Um, and education with both of the other parties in the neighborhood about what the other person might be experiencing. And so you can also engage with the neighborhood of spirit, uh, the spirit of neighboring, excuse me. And to go back to that, a spirit of neighboring 
is really about building that trust, having openness, honesty, like promoting vulnerability, promoting humility, sounds like an oxymoron, um, forgiveness, and that mutuality. But what I love about the spirit of neighboring is the willingness to engage in open dialogue. And so we're bringing people together to, to um, so that they're not, the conflict isn't just kind of bubbling up and there isn't tension, but that we're helping those, that community, that neighborhood develop. And I also, um, we're encouraging a posture of questions and not accusations. So I just think, I, <laughs> I get really excited actually when I think about this um, because it doesn't necessarily take away from your, your opportunity to develop relationships with a family, but it recognizes that your relationship with that family is short term and that what you're doing is setting up that family to have long relationships. And what you're hopefully, hopefully what the neighborhood neighboring volunteers are doing are being um, becoming invested in the relationship with the neighboring family. Um, we've talked about building family resilience. This is where the assessment piece comes in and this is definitely new in the role of the neighborhood resource specialist. I don't know that it's necessarily new, it's gonna take a different form and it's gonna be a little bit um, different. So um, I will say that the assessment piece is also very exciting to me because when you have good assessment, then that leads to good goal planning, which leads to really good small action steps for a family, which leads to feeling successful. So it, when we understand what the problem is, we can more um, do a better job at, or I shouldn't say do a better job at that. I don't think any of us are doing poor jobs. I just think we can more accurately goal plan. And so when we're more, when we have that information before us, then we can, um, in the end, hopefully there will be more success. I will say that if you haven't seen it yet, there's a new family goal plan, which is replacing the service agreement, right? <laughs> yeah. um, which is replacing the service agreement, personal service agreement. Um, and so that really encourages strengths encourages um, identifying strengths, identifying needs, and small action steps. So that is on the new neighboring, um, mem and members only, new with neighboring. So I would encourage you, it's in the case management section. Um, and there's an increased focus on being family-centered. The connections to community resources, I think that that is work that you've already been doing, but just a renewed interest. We also actually just developed a potential income checklist, which you can find in the, I wrote it down because I couldn't remember, um, improved find, in member, it's also in the new neighboring um, section on members only. In the improved financial position section, you will be able to f um, find the potential income checklist. And so that's just a list of like all of the resources that we could come up with um, across the country with little descriptions of what they do and say, hey, how can we um, be connecting our families to resources? I know that across the country we're all working towards finding affordable housing and sometimes we need to use um, different types of resources to be able to help families meet their goal of finding stable and stable housing and so um, part of that is there and we're, we want to um, give families the most resources so that they can be successful with or I should say be have stable housing and then the last um, is that we have really prioritized housing. Again, we talked already that we're modeled after the housing first. And um, this morning, Dr. DeCandia actually even mentioned that the first step to healing trauma is safety and stabilization. And she also acknowledged several times that homelessness is trauma. So if we're hoping to heal that trauma of homelessness, which if we're ho hoping to be part of that healing, that safety, and stabilization of finding a house becomes really important. Um, you can think of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, that your basic needs are met, then you can function um, and work at meeting your higher needs. 
Landlord Partnerships, I encourage you to come tomorrow. Stephanie and um, also Ben will be sharing about developing landlord partnerships. So I encourage you to join that session as well, but we are really seeing them as a priority of building partners landlord partners um, we're working with them we have a new landlord brochure which isn't in print yet but we will be um, printing it soon and sending it along in your neighboring in your training materials but um, just being able to recognize that they are a part of this process encouraging that communication as well as encouraging them to understand the benefits that could come with renting to a bridge of hope neighboring family, such as um, maybe having the money management piece that you work so faithfully on can be beneficial um, or can be motivating, or um, having that communication, having somebody to communicate with instead of always feeling like you need to talk with the tenant to have that person to kind of be the mediator. Um, and that we're creating, that we're providing holistic support. And so we're not just addressing the housing, housing challenges, but that we're also addressing um, holistically the person and their family. And then the last but not least is um, the way that we practice. I think that people have been practicing this way, but we're just encouraging and really made sure that it was worded well and, and really emphasized in our and what we want to do is to be family-centered, strengths-based. Like, I, I come from a very personal um, background where I believe that finding somebody's strengths are part of the answer to resolving their challenges. And so being able to identify those strengths um, and be strengths-based in your approach with them. And the strengths-based definition is broader than that. But And also being trauma-informed in our approaches with the spirit of cultural humility. So. Um, that is a brief, really quick overview so that we can uh, have more time of conversation.